Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Reverend Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study. But right now, I want you to get prepared for a lesson that's going to help you find a place of ultimate security and safety. All right? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Corinthians chapter 3. And it's going to lead us into this study tonight. So, verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit, King James, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or freedom. So where God's spirit is in you, hopefully, you ought to have some freedom tonight. Now watch this. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Comedian Lily Tomlin said, The road to success is always under construction. I like that. What she's saying is that life, as you're moving through life, trying to get from one point to the next point, trying to make sure your life is kind of serene, peaceful, successful. He said, she's saying that there's going to be roadblocks, there's going to be obstacles, there's going to be potholes, there's going to be accidents, there's going to be detours. Something's going to happen as we're trying to push through that we're going to need some strength. Everybody know what I'm talking about? How many know your life has taken some sharp turns at a time? And so life itself, I got a word for it, can be dangerous. What do you mean by dangerous? It's dangerous just living. Look, what I'm saying is that our fleshly, our existence on this side, we live in this very tenuous, dangerous environment, and in this fleshly body is dangerous. What am I saying? Because the body, at any moment, we can suffer a catastrophic illness, or we can develop an illness, and even in this day and age, we can develop an illness that the doctor cannot fix, i.e. coronavirus, as they're dealing with new strains, right? But you look around, think about it, just, you don't have to do anything. You can contract an illness, maybe uh, blood disease, uh, cancer, there's a multitude of those. You can get heart problems, or before you know it, you can have a stroke. Before you know a kidney, right? before you know it, something can happen that can take your life to a place where you no longer feel safe and secure. Or maybe we'll lose, we'll have a job career change, our job shuts down, money gets funny. Maybe something happens to one of our children and we gotta live with a crisis that we never thought we'd have to live with. Whatever the situation, it's dangerous out here trying to live out here on our own because, and here's the one you don't want me to talk about, the one area that's probably more prevalent than anywhere else is our mental and emotional health. We can be healthy today and it goes down, struggle, why? Darkness, why? Isolation, why? Those other things I proceeded to talk about, those things can lead us to a place where we look good on the outside, smile for the camera, but our mental and emotional health, you know, that secret place where while you're looking at somebody, your mind is doing mental gymnastics and you're trying to figure out, how can I get safe today? It's dangerous. And that's why God has shown us through our life experiences, through what we know about his word, through our walk with him, we need to constantly pursue a place of safety and a place of security. Why? Because not only is life under construction, not only is the you know, road to success under construction, we're under construction. And that place of security, you might say, well, Pastor, that's God. Right. I agree. But it's no good to have him if you're not chasing him. It's no good to have him 
And he have all the power if you don't get to him. It's no good to know what he has, to walk around, you know, you're watching the virtual, you read your Bible every now and then, feeling spiritual, you allow yourself to accept some of the down times. Come on, you're looking at me now, in your house, scared like the rest of the world, acting like the rest of the world, and God is saying, not so. You should be secure and safe. So the problem is, not just knowing God is safe. Here's the problem of this lesson we're going to be talking about the next few weeks. You have to pursue him and get to him in order to be saved. Because the reality is, our safety, you like that, is in sanctification. Holiness. Ugly word. Boy, nobody wants to talk about holiness. Everybody says, don't tell this generation. The millennials don't want anything to do with holiness. We have to keep everything cool and cold and steady. Well, here's what I'm telling you. The only safety is in continually living a life of sanctification. Yep, that means you can't be where you were yesterday today. That means you can't just know the same 10 Bible scriptures you knew two years ago today. It means you can't run around saying the same dead, dried up past and wonder why you're not ready for the next dangerous time in your life. So if you hear me, you have to be, here's the word, holy, holiness. You have to constantly be pursuing different levels in God and that process in the Bible, which we're going to talk about, is called sanctification. It's a setting apart my life for the use of God. Not setting apart my life for God's goodies. But setting my life apart. But you listen to me because you constantly, constantly know when you get down where you go. You call for, you cry for. But the reality is, are you pursuing in between? So the name of this study is God wants to take you higher. God wants to take you higher. Higher. You know, we always say, let's go higher in the Lord. Some of you have gotten so low, it's not funny. Living a low Christian life, low expectations, low anointing. God is trying to get you to see that the battles you're fighting now takes higher. You find more peace when you go higher. You find more joy higher. You never see anything in the Bible that tells us to stand still. But I hate to tell you that movement is called holiness. Are you holy? Is holy a bad word for you? Are we so modern we're going to leave holiness? Well, no. The more we get sanctified, the better we are. Now, I grew up in this church, and I know you have too. God's direction for our life is always up, right? God always wants to take us higher. Say that to yourself. God wants to take me higher. He wants to get my head up off the pillow. He wants to quit me, quit me, don't want me running around, acting like life is over, not knowing that I have a better life than him. Oh, somebody is saying, God is telling you holiness is safe. The more word, the more, the more, the closer I get to him, the, the, the more I seek him. That's the safety in my life. And sometimes you gotta break the norm. Reverend Johnson Oakman wrote a song that we all know about, and we sing. It says, "I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, you know, plant my feet." on higher ground. This is a song for believers. I'm pressing on what way? The upward way. What happens? I'm not where I was yesterday. New heights I'm gaining every day. Watch this. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Then the chorus says, Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane that I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I got to be truthful with you. I've been singing that song for years, but I had to look up Table Land. I had to research Heaven's Table Land, and I found out that a 
a tableland is a plateau of ground, especially you can see like a hill. It's an elevated piece of ground and it's flat and it takes you to a higher place as you're walking around an area. All it's saying is that as I keep my mind on heaven's tableland, the high spiritual position that I have in God, as I raise my life to that high, come on, wake up, that high spiritual position, I no longer have to worry about the shortcomings. And then I, like he said, plant my feet on higher ground. Don't let me stay there. Let me continue to move. Now for those, I could have said, you know, did a little bit, the closer I get to you, the more you make me see. All I'm saying is your blessing in God comes from your closeness with him. The text that I read, let's look at it. Grab your Bibles. Let's look at this text again. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit. So let me describe that third chapter for you. If you have your third chapter. It starts out with Paul talking about, um, do I need to make sure I bring letters, accommodations, or do I need some epistles from you? And then he said, no, you are my proof. You are the letters you are my letters written in the spirit, not in stone. What he's saying is that in biblical times, it was common if someone was going to a new place, they would get a letter of introduction, a letter of accommodation. This is a good person. Letter that proved who they were. Paul said, I don't have to do that. Your very salvation means that you understand that you are the letters or the epistles written by the words that I preach to you. Then the text moves down and it talks about, it's an Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant chapter. First Corinthians here, he talks about the time when Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments, and when he came down, he had to put a veil on his face because he had been in the presence of God. Ooh, I'll stop there. You know how you know when you've been in the presence of God, when you saw him enough, is when all of a sudden there is a eerie peace. When I say eerie, not the spooky kind, eerie like I'm calm and I'm looking around like an out-of-body experience. I'm calm going through this and don't know why I'm calm. When you feel God's presence, it looks like whatever's going on gets better, right? You know what I'm saying? It's like everything happens for that day. I, I, before I know it, I'm going on to another thing. That's the presence of God. He said he put a veil on his faith because they could not look into the glory. Now, he compares that glory with the Old Testament covenant of the law. He said the reason it was a fading glory, because Moses didn't have to keep a veil on his face forever. It faded because he was saying that the letter of the law killeth what the Spirit bringeth life. He said the Old Testament was written by you keeping the law and it brought death because none of us can keep the law. Hello, good Christian. Nobody can keep the law. So what he said in that text was, but now this new dispensation, Jesus has come. And now we not only can behold the glory, we go from glory to glory. Ooh, what it's saying is that the Spirit is led by the Holy Spirit and not by me keeping the law. It is the Holy Spirit that blesses me. And it says, and where the Spirit of the Lord is. All right, so it's not just the Ten Commandments and not just the law and not just me not looking at the holiness, knowing that it was going to fade because what you read to me to get me holy, I couldn't keep on my own. I needed something. So God sent the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Now there is freedom because of the Holy Spirit. And we all, with unveiled faces, the Holy Lord, look, he said, it is so cool, we don't even have to veil our faces, and the Spirit of God is different than the Spirit of the law, and it says not only that, we are being transformed into the same image. Don't miss that. So, the law couldn't bring us there, but with the Holy Ghost working on the inside of us, if we seek him, he is transforming us and here is where our life is supposed to go. This is where I know, and you know, if you're honest, we find ourselves going backwards sometimes. We find ourselves 
scared over the things we were scared over 10 years ago. We find ourselves still faking in front of other people because we're not happy. We find ourselves with the same struggles of fears and, and doubts. And maybe it's a little less momentary, but it's still there. And God is saying, the problem is you ought to be going from glory to glory. What is glory? Watch this. Here's what glory is so you won't try to take any of yourself. Glory is when I get in God's presence, just being in close to him in the presence of the Lord. When the spirit is, there is freedom. So I take on that glory, and all of a sudden, I go from glory to glory. Where do I go? I go from one level of closeness to God to another level of closeness to God. I'll be honest. How many of you have felt when you were in that level of glory, you backed up, and that's why there was a time you were much stronger. There was a time you were much happier. There was a time when you had more joy. What happened? Because you be honest, you're not trying to be holy. I'm going to stop saying holy and sanctification. It's anonymous terms as far as God is concerned. You stop seeking, separating yourself, just seeking God. What happens while this transformation process is going on? We're being transferred formed to the same image of Christ. Don't miss this. The transformation, safety, comes from the Spirit of God. Where have you, what is it, where have you been lately? Have you had a isolated moment where it was just you and God and, and you got up and the Spirit was so heavy you felt like shouting? Have you had a time when there was so much anxiety and stress on your life, but you got a scripture and all of a sudden you started fighting? And when you fought your way through, you know where you ended up? At a new level of glory. You ended up closer to God. All I'm saying to you is God always wants to take us higher, but we have to have this process going on. So what's going on? I need you to understand. It's not the eradication of my old fallen nature. Uh-uh. The old man will always be with us. We, according to Colossians, have to modify and kill him. See, that's the problem. The reason some of us are being sanctified is that we know our old nature is still in control of our new creation. When you let your old nature be in control of your new creation, no wonder you're sad. No wonder you're sick. No wonder you're feeling that. So what happens is we want God to kill that old man. God said, no, live with him, but put him under subjection. Get up every morning. Put that old man down. Separate yourself. You got to do this deal. Sanctification is hard work. We want easy religion. Sanctification is hard work. He says you got to kill that man daily. How many of you want to be honest? Man, I have thought some things I shouldn't have thought. Um, I have... And these thoughts should have been going out of my mind. You know, this might not be good in It's been gone, but you know what I'm saying. I should not even be thinking like that. Well, just like you allow those unholy, we that word again, those unsanctified, we that word, things in your life, don't you know that as soon as you open that door, not only are you letting in the unsanctified stuff you like, you're letting in some things you don't like. You're letting in some stuff that you didn't want to let in. I was riding down the road. It was such a beautiful day. One day last week, wherever it was, we had that real beautiful weather. And I remember I stopped and I rolled down the window because I wanted some air to come in. And as soon as I did, this great, big, monster, uh, Godzilla, King Kong fly, zzz, I rolled down the window and tried to get him out and get out. I had mess for the next... <laughs> Uh, what, the next three or four times I'm riding down the road. Because now I try to just let in air, but I also let in that fly. All I'm saying to you is when you open the door to no growth, when you stop seeking God, when you stop doing what the word says, you find yourself in a position where you're not going higher. It is growth and development, look what I put in red, of my new man that brings me to that safety. You want to know where your power is? In sanctification. You want to know where your joy is? In how sanctified you are. It's the closer you get to God. And when we do, we get more power, we get more anointing, we get more passion. Daniel was able 
to stand before the king's guard, Ashpenaz, when he told him, you got to eat the king's food. Daniel said, no, I will not. Uh, it looks good. Can you imagine? He's in jail. They bought him, you know, some scripts and some fried chicken and some collard greens and cornbread and yams. And over there, he had a bowl of oatmeal that God said will make you stronger. Someone said, Pastor, you just messed up because you can't compare oatmeal to green. But listen, what I'm saying is you can't constantly eat soul food, can't eat cakes and, you know, red bell. But you can't eat that stuff constantly and think you're not ruining your body. How in the world are you going to eat the other stuff, that other stuff in your life? Daniel found out that as he sanctified himself and only ate the cost and the vegetables that God had for him, he got stronger than the rest. It took him wanting to be sanctified or set apart. We want to blend into the world. Man, be proud of your salvation. I'm not saying wear a whole bunch of Jesus t-shirts, but if you got one, don't be ashamed to wear it. Wear it just like you would your Nike. Let someone know, I know where my safety comes from in God. So then our new man, our new creation, begins to drive our life. And here is where the blessings come in. It don't matter if you don't have them. We actually get blessed. We get stronger. We can control our habits, our struggles, and our addictions, and the sins that dominate us. Let's pull the covers off for a minute. I have some sins that I have to fight and put down constantly. I read a book that told me most of the major preachers that we listen to, the old theologians, John and Charles Wesley, you can name them, all of them had major fights with depression, struggles in their mind, illnesses. You should see some of the stuff they had to fight just to get the word out. Oh, we talk about Martin Luther and his stand up. Martin Luther was one of the sickest, weakest men there was, but he separated himself to the Spirit of God and God carried him because our habits and our struggles and our addictions and our sins will dominate if we take our foot off the pedal. Every day you should be seeking to get closer because I'm, I'm not saying by how much, I'm not saying by what I know about the world. I'm not saying by being able to quote the books of the Bible. I'm saying by pursuing God. I got to pursue Him. But we have to want it. Here's where a lot of people are. Say it to me. But the alternative is, come on, you, you, you're one of them uh, Sunday junkies, weekend junkies, sermon junkies. Oh, that was a good sermon, a good, good. But the rest of the week, you're not doing anything. You don't feel good. Oh, did you hear that word? Go right back into your same miserable bag. The alternative to sanctification being holy is a miserable, insecure Christian life. This process of going higher is called sanctification. It's the only thing that can keep us safe and secure. You better hear me. You can try to fool folk if you want to. I know when you know our real battles are the ones that we have to feel safe. Somebody watch me right now. You can't worry about what a preacher said, what your sister said, what somebody else said. You have to make sure you have your own area of safety and sanctification. You can't help me three o'clock in the morning, but if I've been seeking God, He can show up because He really ain't going anywhere. I'm the one who left. I just got to get back closer to God. Oh, I can say it again. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're the one that left. Okay, so you sit. Okay, so you have struggles. Okay, you ain't tight. But that don't mean you're supposed to leave God. While all this was going on, He didn't leave you. He was just waiting on you to see. And to get closer. Let's talk about this transformation. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. We know this is 
a scripture from the Beatitudes, right? Jesus spoke. But look at the ending of the hunger for righteousness. He said, you will be satisfied. Satisfied means that I will be to the place that I'm in control and secure in my life. But that's not all. Blessed, good life, feel good, think good, have goods, comes from those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But understand, when God said thirst for righteousness, he wasn't talking about your righteousness. How do we know Jesus wasn't talking about your righteousness? Because the next chapter in Matthew, he said, don't be righteous like the scribes and Pharisees. Showing off in the synagogues and in the streets. That's your righteousness. Some of us are so hooked on our titles, hooked who we are, hooked how long we've been saved, hooked on our image, and you're killing yourself when the darkness comes, you can't stand, you're miserable because you stop being hungry and thirsty for God. You miss so many Bible studies, it's not fun. But you have that television on everything else, you miss. An anointing was coming in the room. God said that he was right there. He was waiting on you to seek him. But you stop. You know what you've done? You settled in. And now you're living your life. I'm telling you, my safety is in sanctification. He wants to take me higher. I like this verse. But Christ, whenever you see a but, you got to know what was preceding that. So. This is the writer saying, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. We are his house indeed when we hold fast to our confidence and our boasting in our, in our hope. So the words that we ought to boast in our hope, right? I wrote this so you can write this. You know, I, I love quoting these scriptures, but I like to write it because I want you to write it down. Here's what the text is telling us. God, you know, Hebrews is about Jesus being better. He said, now, Moses, that's what he's comparing with in this section, was good over the law and over Israel. But Jesus is a better or more faithful servant over God's house, which house we are, right? He was his son who died for us, so we're his house. And right now, if we hold fast, sanctification, in our confidence and our boast and our hope, we will never ever, ever be without safety and security. I want somebody to get up from this lesson realizing I'm allowing my safety and my security. What am I worried about? What am I, what am I even crying for? What happened to me that I got to this point? I can tell you, ooh, ooh, I can tell you. You stop wanting to be holy. Ever. Stop wanting to be sanctified. Want to be the world. You see, believers, here's the dangerous thing. As believers, we battle on two fronts. We are in this world, but not of the world. That's a dangerous place to be. It's, it's a body without a home. It says in that text that we are, why well, I show you the text, but it says, we are in this world, not of the world. We like to say that. I'm in the world, not of the world. But understand the context scripturally where that came from. In John chapter 17, this is not the only scripture, but this is a representative one. Jesus himself said, uh, my people are a peculiar kind of people. They are not of this world, just as I am out of this world. Wait a minute, Jesus, but I've been born into the world. Yeah, but you have the ability, you are sanctified by my spirit in you. So when you seek me, you're not like the world. You don't worry like the world. You don't have to struggle like the world. You can call on me supernaturally and I will bless you. I'm in the world, not of the world. And why do you let the world dominate you? When you let the world dominate you, it's because you haven't realized your position of sonship. Rely on that position of sonship. Rely on what God has said in your life. Right now, somebody, you can begin on this moment. To just reclaim who you are in God and claim a miracle. Claim a deliverance. Claim a blessing. What are the two fronts? Universal struggles. First of all, there are natural battles. Somebody too short, they want to be taller. Somebody too tall, they want to be short. Somebody too fat, they want to be thin. Somebody too thin, they want to be bigger. 
Somebody got a lot of money, they won't give it a long for their money. Somebody ain't got no money, they want to for money. <laughs> what am I telling you? Is that we got battles going on in our mind all over. And the reason I start there, I could have I could have went back and talked about, you know, the battles of illness, but that's not the real battle. The battle that you need to understand is in this world you're gonna have all these struggles, right? But well, Jesus said I already overcame the world, you're gonna have tribulation, right? So I wanted to get that out of the way. But here's the text that I probably should have focused on. Ecclesiastes 12 and 8. Turn here if you got it. Ecclesiastes 12 and 8. It is Solomon who had everything, which I didn't mention all those things, servants and houses and big chariots and gold and money. He had everything. But he was wrote in Ecclesiastes 12 and 8, meaningless meaningless all is meaningless now King James says vanity vanity all is that what he's saying is when I walk around looking and living for that stuff I don't have a purpose you know why some of us got up during the pandemic you know why some of us keep looking up during the pandemic you know why some of us never got ashamed during the pandemic is because we realize that we always had a purpose and a hope my life is not meaningless. My life is not just crying for God giving one miracle after another. No, it's God, what do you want me to do? What can I do for the kingdom? What can I do to bless you? I want to see you because that's where my real safety is. It's not in my paycheck. It's not in my house. It's not in my car. It's not in other people. My real safety is how happy I pursue you. I'm chasing after God every day. And my world goes higher. And higher. Then there is, and here's the danger. So here's why we can't play around like the world can. We also have cosmic battles, spiritual battles. We function in two worlds. Second Corinthians 10, 3 to 5 says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, the mighty through God to the pulling down strongholds. When we look at this text, we find out that we have the devil comes in our mind and tries to trick us and deceive us and we have to cast down those imaginations. You said the devil's in the world's minds too. Uh huh. Not like he is with you. He's trying to stop you from doing what God said. And he's trying to kill you because there's too many witnesses out there for the Lord. You, you do know the devil's trying to kill you. So why are you sitting there not being sanctified, not pursuing God like you're doing something? I go to church next to you. I ain't going to miss you. I'll read about that. I'll, I'll look about what I feel like. I'll get around. Man, some of you in the pandemic, Sunday's not even got a sad birthday anymore. You do everything you want on Sunday and maybe go by 15 minutes of the sermon late at night. Step on some toes, Pastor. Don't got some attitudes. Like you're keeping yourself in this pandemic. Say, bring me to the The devil come like an angel. Like, you know what an angel might make you do? Turn from God. Come here and say, you ain't that bad, man. Because you know your help is in not just being that bad, but being better, but being a pursuer. Can you honestly tell me I'm a pursuer of God? When you pursue God, you become more sanctified and you have more safety and security. 2 Corinthians 12 and 7. The enemy will come and give you a thorn in your flesh. So God gave that. Yup, here's what God did. He allowed that buffer just so you could go higher. If you read that text, Paul's thorn in the flesh was so he could go higher. It lived, so he would be lifted up in his flesh, but lifted up in his spirit. Sometimes I'll tell you, without a thorn every now and then, we would not grow. Thank God for the thorns. In John 3.13, Jesus said, Don't marvel that the world hates you. They hate me. They don't hate you. So you're living in a world that you're trying to emulate, and the world hates you because the world knows you're supposed to be trying to be sanctified. 
Let me say it again. You're supposed to be set apart, have the power, have the anointing, be sanctified. You're trying to emulate the world. Or act like, I'm saved, but I'm still cool. I'm saved, but I'm just like y'all. No, I'm not. I'm set apart. I shout, I read my word. I'm not going to go to scripture you use to hold my mouth. I'll lift my hands and praise God anywhere. Because I realize that sanctification is my safety. So here is my line. We must learn to live for Christ while we are here and make him our priority. If we don't, we continue to live an up and down Christian life with more downs than up. So let me share with you what the more downs and ups are. We will constantly lose battle. Like Judas. Did you know Judas in John chapter 12? He didn't just sell Jesus out. Judas' mindset was you read scriptures. I hope nobody has a Judas spirit, but he was always criticizing other people. Uh, in John chapter 12, verse 6, after the woman, you know, cried and, and, and anointed Jesus and dried his feet where John and uh, the woman took out of that box, right? He said, wait a minute, that, that could have been sold and give it to the poor. He was always thinking about the money, criticizing people. He had a problem because he wouldn't carry money back. That means he didn't have his priorities straight. And I would have to prove that because at the end of his life, what did he sell Jesus out for? The money. It was too late when he found out that was How many is in Alexander? First Timothy. We know that. These are the ones who shipwrecked their faith. Shipwrecked means that they no longer had their ship moving and pursuing under their control. It was being tossed and blown with the wind. And now you got a wreck life. You know, these things have shipwrecked your life because you don't want to be obedient to God. Shipwrecked your life and and find yourself now, I gotta come to God with all these broken pieces, and God puts it back together, and He puts it back together, but the whole time you still live with a whole lot of broken pieces. When God said, if you continue to seek me, it would be that way. Or we will, we will not this is, I, I wouldn't want to be saved if I wasn't happy. But we will not experience the joy of our salvation. Because you don't, you don't, we don't do things. Thomas walked with Jesus the same. You, you know about this? He walked with Jesus the same amount of time as everyone else. Let's leave Thomas alone for a minute. You been in church. You saw the miracles. You sang the same praise songs. You heard the same preaching. Yet you're miserable, disabled, living around, don't have the power. Other folk heard the same thing that they do. You know why? Because they were just not seeking God on a superficial basis. Um, I'm in the crowd. I'm a disciple. But I don't know if you know all that. I pray when I need to. Because I know you can do that. But I don't know if I want to surrender my whole life. Sanctification is where your safety is. And God said, I can't use you if you don't want to go higher. We will miss our assignment and destiny. Remember Jesus went back to his own hometown and the Bible said he could do but a few miracles there. How do we know there wasn't someone who was supposed to be delivered, raised up, or a great prophet in Nazareth but they couldn't because they never saw God. Most Christians miss the joy of sanctification because you don't know its value. Every scripture you read goes into that dichotomy of spirit, soul, and body. So at night when you're crying, your spirit is strong enough to keep your soul intact. Every time you pray, a signal goes into that ethereal part of you, that spiritual part of you. And in your mind, that praise sends you to a place of protection. 
Every time you purposely turn something off and seek God, can you imagine God sitting in the audience just admiring you, telling angels, look, look, look at my son right here. Their favorite broadcast, their favorite program, but they stopped to be with me. They just gave me the same priority that they give their leisure time and their job. We don't understand the value of being sanctified. It's the only thing that kept you where you were. Do I have time to go with scripture? So, here is the process and embodiment. Got you about to this down. I'm going to close on this. Mark 8, 34 and 35. Jesus says, if anyone will come after me, Stop. Now, he had to put the if conjunction in there because he knows you're supposed to be coming after him. But he's letting you know, if you decide you want to claim your inheritance, claim your sonship, claim your power, if you decide you want to do that, if you decide you want to get a lay hands on sick folk, if you decide you want all your salvation said, here's what you have to do to get there. Not easy. Look. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Deny yourself. Grab your burden. Throw it on your back with joy. And then follow him. Can I demonstrate what that looks like? It means whatever burden you're carrying, and that's the cross God allowed after you pursue it. He said, if you're one of those Christians that will drag it in, I can set you free. If you will follow me in indifferent moments, if you will get to the point that the righteousness you seek is above your own prideful righteousness, if you say, I want my light to shine for God. He said, you will follow sanctification. The process is captured in three acts. Right now, I'm going to tell you how to get healing. I'm going to tell you how to get deliverance. I'm going to tell you how to leave from where you are right now. Get, I'm going to tell you how to ride down the road and have joy and flood your car. I'm going to tell you how to lay your head at night and watch the glory of God float over your bed while you're sitting there, whatever you're doing, because God's protecting you. Can I tell you? It's right there in that text. Follow Jesus with our cross. Deny ourself. Deny myself means there's moments myself want a whole lot of stuff, I gotta tell it no. <laughs> myself want to do stuff, I gotta tell it no. Uh, somebody told me, um, I get I'm, I'm jealous. No, you you allow yourself to be jealous. I, I get angry, but you have enough anointing. To put that angry spirit down if you want to. Watch. Then become more like him. I purposely made up in my mind that at the height of my most, you're going to love this, so you're going to grab it. I find myself, and the preachers are supposed to confess this, but I find myself sometimes out of nowhere will come. This super duper anxiety and stress trying to arrest me take over my mind. Have you ever been here? It's like something just comes from nowhere. I'm sitting there. I could have just got the preaching. I could have just got the reading my word. But I realized at that moment I found how to defeat the height of my fears and struggles. Here's what I found out. I found out, and I'm not talking about grumping and groaning and putting stuff down. I found out that if I have a continuous action of not allowing that to affect me to the point that when that comes, I actually get more holy, more spiritual, and more um, calm. It's like, I'll say, oh, this means that God is getting ready to do something or is doing something or that I'm doing life and life is so good the devil's trying to stop me 
And pretty soon, the spirit that I choose puts down the other spirit. So when I would be angry, when I feel those angry moments coming, I fool them, and I be super calm, super nice. So if I want to cuss, and, and Christians don't cuss, but if I want to cuss, I'll do the opposite and say something nice. And pretty soon, it may sound crazy, but somebody says, I need anger madness. Anger madness means you're allowing yourself to take over. I'm so fearful and frightful. That's because you're not going through a life of continuous following, denying, becoming more like him. Most Christians knew that God was calling them to live a life of righteous for submission to Christ and actually act on, a few actually act on these desires. I'm closing right here. And these are three things that bless you. Make a commitment to losing your life to find it. To follow even when you're suffering. More so. And deny yourself to find your true self. Now, I'm going to close this by you. Oh, next week, you're going to notice this. Because next week, where we're going to go, we're going to actually look at the sanctification gap. Well, what are the gaps? Then? Well, what am I doing? What am I leaving open so the enemy can come in and mess my life? That's where we start. That's where we start. We just told you a little bit about that. We're going to start. I want to close with the same scripture I opened with. And I'm going to ask you to do some homework. I'm going to ask you to practice going from glory to glory. Here, take the scripture in. Verse 17, 2 Corinthians, chapter 3. Now the Lord is that spirit. What spirit? The only spirit that can keep me safe. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I got to run to my place of freedom. But we all with open faces beholding as a glass the glory of the Lord. God said, you don't have to hide your face anymore. The veil is gone. This is a covenant initiated by me. My glory is in your life. You can look at my glory now. And as you come closer to my glory, you go from glory glory with that same spirit and we're made in his image. God bless you. I want to pray for you tonight. And if you can just read that scripture over and just tell yourself, I'm going from glory to glory. And think about one thing. The closer I get to God, the safer I'm going to be. Let's pray. Father God, I pray for someone tonight who the enemy has put roadblocks and cutoffs in their lives and their families being ruined and their lives being ruined and they have no joy and uh, their salvation has become ho-hum and they walk around missing all these miracles and this glory. They don't smile at you every day. Lord, I pray that you would put a new revelation in their heart that every day I'm going to chase God because my Savior